Okay. Can you see the slides now? Yes, I can see them. Fantastic. I'm always amazed if this works. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for, for having me. I'm here to represent the SOS and SSN subgroup of the first joint OGC dub, 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 joint working group on spatial data on the web. Um, while I'm giving a presentation here, I think it's important to highlight that this is not just my work, it's the work of a larger team, namely our chair, Armin Haller, and myself, Simon Cox, Dan Lepuk, um, Carrie Taylor, and Maxime Le Francoise, and there are, of course, also others that have um, helped substantially in shape what I'm going to present here. There were just too many names to list, so I'm just listing the editors without implying that the contributions of others was um, less important. So what I would like to present, and I was told I have like 10 minutes to do so, is the SOSA and SSN ontology. In fact, it's a stack of ontologies. And, and before we start, I would like to talk briefly about the modularization and about the naming, because I believe this can be a little bit confusing. So SOSA and SSN are very closely related. And in fact, the product that we are delivering, so to speak, the official standard is going to be called Semantic Sensor Network Ontology, so SSN. But as the original SSN that some of you may know of that originated from the WWW incubator group for Semantic Sensor Network Ontologies had a core called the Stimulus Sensor Observation Core, the new SSN has also a core but with a different name and a different scope, namely the Sensor Observation Sample and Actuator Core, or short, SOSA. So at the very core of what we are delivering and what is currently moving to candidate recommendation um, is the SOSA ontology. The Semantic Sensor Network ontology is a more complex ontology that imports the SOSA ontology. And then a number of what we call vertical and horizontal modules that either, if they are horizontal, add in scope. So for instance, we have a module for system capabilities like the survival ranges of sensors, for instance, or um, vertical in scope that align our set of ontologies to other ontologies like OBOE uh, or the Prof ontology or the Dulce Ultralight Foundation ontology. You may also see that some parts here are bluish and others are red. The red ones are the normative parts and the blue ones are the non-normative part. This only matters if you're interested in the process of standardization, but the very simple version, so to speak, is that the only part that you are supposed or you have to take as granted and as fixed is the red part. The other parts are optional or in the sense of adding further content without being part of the standard. I wouldn't say that they are less important, but they are under less quality control or maintenance, so to speak. And we believe that this modular design is very important. It's way better than what we had before, like a one-size-fits-all solution for the old SSN. And while the old SSN was very widely used, at least to, to our knowledge, and this was one of the key criticisms that is very heavyweight and it only comes prepackaged in one way. The only downside of this modularization is that it's a little bit more difficult to explain and that for historical reasons, it and the agenda setting of the working group, it leads to this funny situation where the SSN is a module of itself. So the entire product is called Semantic Sensor Network Ontology, but inside this product, SOSA is the core and the Semantic Sensor Network Ontology is an outer ring, so to speak. You know, this is not the best of all possible solutions, but it's part of the progress in which all of this developed and it's well explained in the specs that I can post in the chat. So. Moving on to the next slide, um, I would like to very, very briefly dive into some of the key changes. All the details are provided in the specifications, and of course, you can uh, contact me or the working group directly if you have any questions. So the key influence is, of course, the original Semantic Sensor Network product from the WWW incubator group that had SSN as the ontology and SSO, which stands for stimulus sensor observation as its core. And again, SSO is now replaced by SOSA. Other key influences are, of course, OGCs, O&M specifications, and SensorML, as well as a variety of related products that is either early sensor 
of since the network ontologies or Internet of Things and Web of Things related ontologies. Um, again, they are listed in our main product. So some of the, the key highlights of why we did what we did and what has changed if you're an old user of the SSN, they are, I think they can be structured into three packages. First, addressing changes in scope and audience. So we substantially broadened the audience in introducing the lightweight source ontology. When we designed the original SSN, um, linked data was still an evolving topic. And ontologies like schema.org for the lightweight annotation of web pages and scientific observations didn't exist yet. So the old SSN has a very heavyweight axiomatization, in fact, with a fixed alignment to a top level ontology. Now we are substantially broadening the scope to the scientists, the web developer, citizen science, and applications that run directly on the sensor and therefore have limited resources by introducing SOSA. SOSA is also entirely self-contained, so you can use SOSA entirely on its own while you have to use SOSA if you're using SSN. And all the alignments are also optional, so again, for SOSA users, you can just focus on the most important and very intuitive to understand classes and relations. But for those of you who would like to have more or who are familiar with the more heavyweight axiomatization of the SSN, all of this is still there. So sometimes I feel that people think, oh, why have you, you know, gotten rid of all those great classes? No, everything is still there. The packaging is just different. So one of the other key changes in scope is the introduction of sampling sampler and sample classes and their relations to broaden the scope to better serve the scientific community as well as the classes actuator and actuation in related relations to better serve the Internet of Things community. And then as far as addressing shortcomings of the initial SSN goes, we of course, you know, there were a lot of lessons to be learned. And so we streamlined, for instance, the relations between the old device platform and system classes. In fact, getting rid of devices in the process of doing so, because there was a lot of confusion about what is a de device, what is a platform, what is a system. And there were there was also a little bit of a, there was some rough edges, let's say it this way, about which of those components have to be physical and which of those components can be virtual. For instance, in a simulation, everything in SOSA now can be physical or virtual and the same goes for SSN. We also clarified some key notions like procedure, which was formerly known as a plan, and observation. Observation is probably the most important change. It's now an event and not a situation anymore, which is the only thing that really you know, can lead to some hiccups if you're transitioning from old SSN to new SSN and so on. And we made some fixes to the Deutsche Ultralight alignment and made it truly optional. Now, before it was also optional, but if you really try to use it independently, um, they were, it, it's cre it was creating a mess. And finally, uh, we made some changes due to technological developments, changing the underlying description logic used, or the family of description logics used for SUSE and SSN to make it uh, lighter on the reasoning requirements so that it can be embedded directly on small devices and embedded devices. And for SOSA, we went away from the guarded domain and range restrictions of SSN, which were already very you know, conservative, so to speak, to an even more conservative model to use domain include and range includes from schema.org that don't come with any formal semantics. So um, you still have the formal semantics from the SSN side, but an informal semantics uh, from the SOSA side. So um, moving on to a very, very broad overview about what is in SOSA and SSN. So we have classes and relations about the deployment of sensors, sensor systems, and platforms or sampling campaigns. And classes and relations about systems and system properties and conditions, so the operation ranges, survival ranges, battery conditions, and so on and so on for systems and sensors. We have classes and relations for features, so features of interest here, for procedures and results, and at the core observation, actuation, and sampling is our key um, events and the related classes and observations that, for instance, model how you observe a certain property of some feature of interest or a sample of that feature of interest. So I'm not going to present all of them. There will be way too much for our limited time here, but please let me know if you have any questions. I'm going to focus on the observations, simply assuming that this will be of the largest interest to, to most of you. 
And sampling is, of course, also very important, and I'm happy to talk about this, and the same goes for actuation. So um, if you look at the next slide, which is called Overview of Observation-Related Classes and Relations in SOSA, this is just the SOSA view of those classes that directly relate to observation. Keep in mind that there's way more that is also related, but you know we had to cut off the graph somewhere to make individual slides. There are also overview slides that capture all of it. So don't wonder if the, the sample isn't here. Of course, you can have samples on which you do the observations. It's just the visualization here that is restricted to some of the core classes. So to give you like the, the nutshell version of what's going on here, and I know that this is a busy slide, what this is basically saying is that you have some sensor that is carrying out an act, namely the act of observing something. So what is it observing? Well, it's observing a feature of interest or a sample of that feature of interest. And by doing this observation, it creates some result, which is the value of your measurement. The sensor itself doesn't need to stand on its own. It's typically deployed on a platform. So for instance, if you would like to talk about the geometry, how the sensors are arranged. Um, the observation is not only about the feature of interest, it's more specific, it's about one observable property of the feature of interest, like the state height, for instance, of a water body, and to make sure that results are reproducible, and I will be talking about PROF in a second, and there's a very important class, namely the observation procedure, or here the procedure class, which tells you how the observation was carried out, so the sensor doesn't do some arbitrary measurement, or you as the person, or whoever, is the actor using the sensor, but by following like a like a recipe, but not for making your favorite chocolate cake, but for taking your favorite observations. So you can distinguish between, let's say, soil temperature and air temperature and so forth. And what I think is worth highlighting here is that we really spend a lot of time, and I really mean a lot of time, in making sure that we allow for heavy use by the scientific community, as well as lightweight use, if you just want to share even if, as a scientific community member, your data in a very lightweight style on the web, or you are interested in citizen science, or you don't care about some of the detailed axiomatizations. And one of the great examples for these design decisions and how uh, difficult it is sometimes to make these trades off are uh, the has simple result properties that allow you to directly attach a literal observation, a literal value to an observation or the reified version using the has result relation and the result class, and then you can use a QDT or data cubes or whatever you would like to use to represent the results of said observations. So we support both. And one thing that may be a little bit confusing, and that's why I put it on the slides, is that procedures and observed properties are in a one-to-n relation to observation sensors, features of interest, and so forth. So what I mean by that is that there's not the temperature property of room one, room two, room three, water body one, water body two, but what is individual are the observations and the results, while the observed property is something that you would look up from the from a code list of measurement types to ensure that we know that we all talk about the same things being observed, namely temperature. And, and the same is true for procedure. So one procedure, namely a description of the sequence in which you are carrying out your work, applies to many, many observations. So the procedure to measure the state height using a, a still water sampling station, for instance, for water bodies, is the same no matter how many million observations you are carrying out. And sample is not shown here, but still an interesting fact that is worth considering is that samples are features of interest, which means we can sample samples and we can make observations about samples, talk about how samples relate to the feature of interest, and again, samples being features of interest can be sampled themselves. So um, what is the, the SSN part here? What is added here in the SSN part that's shown on in blue on the next slide? So you see that we are adding quite a bit more. We are adding inputs and outputs for the procedure. We are adding the stimulus for the sensor, so the thing that triggers the sensor to create the observation. We are adding generic properties, for instance, conditions, um, or for instance, state and state changes for actuators, systems, so as another level of abstraction for platforms and sensors with their capabilities, and then deployments for deployments campaigns. And moving on to the next slide, um, we also serve, as I said, vertical segmentation modules. Here's one uh, example, namely the alignment to, to the PROF ontology, 
I'm not showing the alignment axioms here. I'm only showing you the, the core features of proof and then the observation, actuation, and sampling uh, slides. But you can immediately see what's going on here, right? So observation, actuation, and sampling, they are activities in the proof world versus sensors and actuators, which are, uh, for instance, either agents or entities, procedures are plans and so forth. So it, it aligns, in fact, very, very well. The same is true for Oboe alignment, Dolce Rutolite alignments, O&M alignments, and so on, and you can look them up in the specs. And um, last slide, I believe, is about the horizontal segmentation modules that I mentioned. We had the vertical on the last slide as an example. Here's an example for a horizontal segmentation module, um, namely the module that describes all the properties um, and capabilities of, uh, for instance, sensors. So you can talk about the accuracy and resolution and detection limits and measurement ranges and the repeatability and the latency and survival properties like the battery lifetime and so on and so on. Um, well, I guess that was everything I had to say to give you this very brief overview. Um, please let me know if you have any questions either now or mail me or mail the, the team. We are moving to candidate recommendation right now, so if there would be anything urgent or pressing where you think, oh, you really need to take this into account or you really need to clarify this, then please let us know as soon as possible. Um, before I talk too long here, one last call for action. We are in the stage we are looking for implementation evidence. So to make this all become a standard according to dub 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 rules, we need to show the usage of those classes. So if you are interested in what we are doing to annotate your own work, we are not going to, we are not only helpful, we are not only thankful for your help, but we are also willing to, willing to actively help you in converting your data to SSN and SOSA because that's part of the work that we have to demonstrate anyway. And well, thank you very much for, for listening and I hope this was interesting and, and relevant to your work. Excellent, thank you so much, um, Christoph. So, um, yeah, so I think maybe what makes the most sense here is to go on to Josh Lieberman and get, um, get our second presentation going and then maybe we can have questions for both of you after unless anybody has a quick clarifying question for Christoph while I pass a pass the presentation. Yeah, so I'm not sure that the title really described what I ended up uh, intending to do, which is to kind of take this back a bit to OGC to the SWE and IoT standards and uh, try to see where they fit in. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so Josh, do we want to just go go right on to you, and then we can take sort of a broader questions and discussion period after? Sure. So um, this is a little bit more uh, context, I think, which is, you know, there has been efforts at what's called semantic sensor networks, although the, the network part and to some extent the semantic part has been unclear. Um, there is work on dealing with observations in the schema.org context and so on. So, so there've been a lot of different ways to nibble around the edges. Meanwhile, last 10 years in OGC, there's been work and what, what has been called the sensor web enablement and now is sort of SWE dash internet of things uh, because somewhere we realize that, you know, when people mean things as an internet of web or things, they're really meaning features in the uh, geospatial sense. And so figuring out, you know, what that feature is, how to characterize or represent it, and then how to uh, attach properties, uh, attributes to it um, is, you know, something that uh, OGC and um, geospatial practitioners have been working on for a long time. Um, it just has a neat new name now. Uh, there are other aspects of this in terms of rapid data and in terms of moving objects, but uh, there is an affinity which, you know, hopefully SOSA and SSN fit into. So um, a couple of things I would sort of point out on what uh, Jana was talking about. Um, there's, there's a, I think, a sort of a fundamental point of clarification when we're talking about 
how does SSN and SOSA connect to what we understand about uh, features in the world? And that is when we think about features, we think about them being entities with attributes. And we say, okay, this room uh, has a temperature attribute or in our um, entity. Uh, and when the SSN and SOSA talk about observed property or property, um, that's not a property <laughs> in the OWL or RDF or UML sense. What it is, is a, an entity which uh, defines what that observable property could be for that feature. Uh, so, you know, why does it get caught up in having, you know, the observed property is uh, connected to the observation, it's connected to the uh, feature of interest, it's connected to the result, um, because that is a, an entity itself and not the same thing as an attribute of that room, which is, for example, has temperature 15. So there is a, an important difference between a, a rigorous observational model and how we then transmute that into the properties of features that we're interested in. And so that's a really important thing to mention because that then translates into how things like services work, where you want to go from uh, the entities, for example, that you know about to their properties, or you want to go from observations to those feature um, entities. So let's go to, you know, what are we talking about in OGC world? Well, uh, Yano mentioned that you know observations and measurements are important. Uh, OGC, ISO uh, standard, both conceptually in terms of XML, meaning uh, GML encoding, and uh, in a couple of forms, uh, an ontology or OWL encoding. And so observations and measurements are being aligned to SSN and SOSA. Now there's an alignment module for that. Uh, and many of the terms are quite the same. They may have slightly different scopes uh, in that observations and measurements focuses, for example, on observing, whereas SSN and uh, SOSA are adding sampling and actuating particularly. Uh, one of the things that observations and measurements doesn't do is get very deeply into procedures. That's the domain of the sensor markup language. WE common. Uh, and those things then get um, exchanged through three principal services the sensor observation service, planning service, and sensor things API. And so the, you know, one great success of SSN and SOSA would be to align not only with these uh, standards such as sensor ML, but also with the services which really are based on that information model. So let's go to O&M real quickly. And uh, so this should look pretty familiar because this is very close to uh, the uh, SOSA and SSN uh, model, and particularly that having an observation is an activity that uh, uses a procedure, has a result, uh, has different types of time, result, phenomenon time, and ends up being interpreted as a, an observable property of some feature of interest. Uh, so uh, the challenge is that uh, it doesn't cover actuating. There's a uh, an extension of O&M for sampling, but actuating is a kind of a separate activity right now. Okay, so sensor ML uh, deals with that procedure part, uh, describing sensors, and in particular, it, it has this uh, formalism that sensor is just another kind of process that's taking uh, some kind of data, would be a stimulus, and converting that into an observation 
results and output of that procedure. And so it's a quite complex language, but very powerful because it can describe how a sensor gets a result. It can describe uh, all the sorts of metadata and properties around that of the phenomena and uh, the uh, limitations and capabilities of those uh, procedures and devices, and also the uh, the results. Uh, it can also be used to describe uh, processing to go on those observations or on anything else. Uh, but it does not have a an RDF encoding right now, and there is a I think. Uh, very considerable, but as yet not completely defined overlap with SOSA and SSN. Uh, if we go to a sensor observation service, then the service itself for uh, accessing, for storing and reading observations is very much based on the observations and measurements uh, model. Uh, having observations, having sensors, having results, uh, and uh, you can see in this get observation uh, request that it's showing, okay, we want observations from this place, this time, with this kind of result for this phenomenon, and so on. And so very uh, much, uh, yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Is it possible to make your um, presentation full screen just to see it a little better? Uh, let's see what happens. Yes, if you could, that'd be great. Does that still show up? Actually, that is gone for me, so maybe that was not ideal. Sorry. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I can't uh, see it anymore. I I made it full screen on my own screen, and it was I was able to read it. If that's okay. I mean, if you just stretch out that box. It might be. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Main screen. Okay. Does that show up now? Yeah, that looks great. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so this doesn't include actuation. Um, and okay, how can I get going here? Sensor plank. So. Uh, so there's another service. So this is split up into two services. Uh, sensor planning service um, is, uh, you know, basically for uh, actuating a sensor to take an observation originally, but it can be uh, just as applicable to setting something. So actuating can be triggering uh, observation, but it can also be triggering some other action that a uh, an actuator can take. Uh, and so similar structure, um, plain old XML and KVP uh, interfaces, but because there isn't really an actuation uh, language in OGC, it kind of stands on its own as far as how it describes uh, uh, what to do and how to do it. So finally, uh, there's a newer um, interface which has an interesting overlap with all of the previous. Uh, sensor things API. So this is a, a very rest oriented resource oriented uh, interface for observations and uh, It's based on the OData interface of what sort of uh, Parameters you can put on gets and puts uh, and so on uh, There's uh, part one right now. It's sensing uh, there is uh, work on actuation and interestingly, differently from the other services, it also has an MQTT-based notification mechanism. So it is able to push things as well. So if you look very quickly at this, uh, you see things you recognize, observation, sensor, feature of interest, uh, observed property, but um, there's something strange going on here. And uh, that's that data stream in the middle because really it's very much trying to connect uh, data to things uh, and is observing the, some an ambiguity in the Internet of Things, Web of Things world where that thing may be a feature of interest. So, you know, we have a room and we're measuring the temperature of it, uh, but it 
can also be more reliably uh, the sensor device itself or the immediate area around it. If somebody is walking around with their phone, which is measuring temperature. And uh, so the thing is the, you know, the immediate um, sensing space of the phone, but every time it takes a measure, it's looking at the temperature of some different feature uh, or it can be interpreted as that. And so uh, these two imperatives in the IoT world of attaching this data to a thing and also of um, bundling together, you know, okay, this sensor, this observed property, here's how it's changing over time. So it's another way of getting at the, you know, how is this thing we're interested in changing over time? I'm not as interested in the observational process. Uh, so this is kind of in the middle right now and in that people have noticed that this doesn't really fit with either observations and measurements or SOS or for that matter, SSN and SOSA. And so uh, there will be, I think, work in the future to fit this better to, for example, connect the observ property to observation as well as to data stream to make data stream an alternate perspective from this service. On the other hand, this is a very easy to use service. So, uh, you know, we'd love for this to be successful and yet compatible with uh, other models for the sensing and actuating processes. Um, and then, as uh, Yano mentioned, uh, there's a pretty good alignment to PROV. Uh, that really needs to be extended to uh, the other models and particularly to the services if we want to have the means when using things like a planning service to generate the provenance from these that are compatible with the instructions that went into it and the way the data is modeled in that service, then we really need to connect this with mappings that are uh, better agreed upon. So, so that's kind of the situation in terms of connecting these to the ontologies have been a little behind up until now. And with this new SSN SOSA ontology, it's pulling a little ahead. And uh, so there's some catch up to be done, but uh, it, I think, provides some good opportunity for harmonization uh, going forward. So that's it. Excellent. Well, thank you, um, Josh, and thank you, actually, both, both of our presenters. Um, so great. So at this point, I think maybe uh, we can open it up for a little bit. If, if folks have any questions for either presenter, now would be a great time to jump in. I have a question. This is Beth. Um, this was really interesting. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, I have a, a question about, I guess it's really sort of about types versus tokens. Um, am, I, am I right that the sensor network ontology is targeted toward a single or an individual observation? Because I guess one of the things that happens in earth science is, you know, we've got sensors on satellites that are out there collecting, you know, let's say they're measuring radiative flux at the top of the atmosphere, orbiting the Earth, taking a measurement every millisecond. And you really wouldn't want to have to describe every one of those measurements with a set of RDF assertions. And so um, it's, you know, I guess I'm curious about possible applications with this ontology because I it seems to me like um, you need some some sort of type model, which is to say this sensor is making measurements of this type, and then you can describe the type of measurement, but you want some other mechanism for recording the results, right? I mean, you, you wouldn't be able to create an RDF file that recorded the value of every measurement being made 
on a um, satellite, on a sensor, you know, a satellite sensor in earth science because you would just quickly have such an explosion of data that you wouldn't be able to store it anywhere. Does, do you, does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm getting at? That I'm, wonder, I'm curious about the ontology model and whether those um, entities, those observations are individual, a single observation, like one reading of a sensor or whether those could be types of readings that get done. So uh, the answer is a little bit more complex than I can give in like just you know two minutes, but it goes like this. You can use source and SSN to model types of sensors. So you can say this is a sensor that only models this particular, only measures this particular observed property, or you can have a sensor that only measures certain types of observable features. So you can say this is a sensor that exclusively monitors water bodies, for instance. All of this is possible. When it comes to how many observations can you actually store, then you can also look at it both ways. So what you can do and what we also see being done is indeed taking observations every few seconds and storing them using RDF. I don't think that there's a, this of course a little bit of an overhead and you have to decide what you would like to store, what you would like to discard, but there's no problem in doing this. And in fact, people who work on stream reasoning have shown that you can process that data quite efficiently. Another approach is of course based on, you know, changing your sample interval. Even if you sample once every second, typically you only take, you know, hourly values, daily values, or the mins and maximums and so forth. So you can do all of that. But you can also do composite observations, right? So keep in mind that observation is just the act of the sensor arriving at some result. And this can include as many pre-processing stages as you would like. So to give you one example, um, an entire data queue can be one observation. That's why we have why that's why we have this reification over has result in the result class. So in your case, you wouldn't use has simple result, but you would use has result, and the result could be an entire you know scene from a, a remote sensed image, or it could be um, an entire campaign, like for instance in a data cube or something like that. So the granularity of modeling. Um, is something that we try to to take into account. And thanks for this in very interesting question. Yeah, I would just add in that, um, you know, there, it's important to pay attention to what is the voluminous part. So right. if you're taking a, you know, a 50 megabyte image every second, the, the data around that image are not actually very big, um, could well be handled in RDF. Uh, the image, no, I don't think you'd want to put the image into RDF, but that doesn't um, so really I... limit you from. I've seen that are um, first level, you know, sort of raw. I mean, they've been undergone some processing, but literally every millisecond, this um, this sensor was taking a measurement of radiative flux you know, on uh, at wherever it was as it's orbiting the Earth pretty dang fast, right? Every 90 minutes or something, it's making a, an orbit and every, and it's, you know, it's got a scanner and there are these arrays of numbers which represent the values, right? And every one of those, um, every, you know, that's 600, is that you wouldn't be able to, for each one of those specific observations, right, the value at right now is 0.10 and right now it's 0.15, each one of those you really wouldn't be able to write an RDF, a full RDF description about it. And so you have to go up a level and describe sort of at the type level, oh, this is a measurement of radiative flux and it's got, you know, these these, you know, measuring this feature, I mean, I guess in this case, the feature would be something like the top of the atmosphere and, and radiative flux is its property. I, I'm actually not sure. I have to think about that a little bit. I find this terribly interesting. It's not at all a criticism. I'm just, you know, trying to figure how it might work into, um, it might be adapted to accommodate the kind of data that I've seen Um, 
around NASA, for example, in RDF. I, I really don't think you can. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna, I, a few years ago, I was involved in an experiment with Cray Computers, and they had a, a developed an RDF tool store. And we were trying to do something like that. And even you know, within a month, it was clear that we had had already swamped the Cray supercomputer. So um, it just wasn't doable. So it's just you know, just an observation, really. I mean, I'm I'm just interested in how this might be adapted for that kind of situation. Well, we're so yeah. over Cray computers, but um, <laughs> as, as you <laughs> I know, know, I know. pointed out, uh, there are sort of two implementation approaches, at least. Um, one is to have a smaller number of instances with more complex data types, you know, arrays and vectors. And the other is to have a, you know, a full observational um, assemblage for each observation. But um, that doesn't mean you have to write it all in, you know, RDF XML. Um, the approach that Sweet Common takes, for example, is to say, you know, here are the entities in a fairly complex language that are encoded in this very compact um, data representation. So they're not incompatible. Right, right. Yeah, I, I've done some work in this area myself and taken the approach of saying, you know, there are classes of measurement types. So the, the members of the class are actually descriptions of measurements and then somewhere else you record the actual observations so it's, so it's, this is this is a very interesting question thanks again and i hope you can contact me later and we can we can try to to model this together so a few things here to add to what what josh said which was uh, i think a very good answer as i said measurements and observations can be uh, composite observations right so you know the entire an entire campaign can even be just one observation because the result that you create using this verification can be anything, you know, a data cube, a CSV file, an image, whatever suits your needs, right? When right. it comes to scalability, two things are worth mentioning. Modern triple stores can handle literally tens and hundreds of billions of items. So there was a lot of, you know, change over the last, I would say, three or four years about how to do this. But there's even a better thing that I think is really not as known as it should be. There's a binary data format for RDF called HDT. I will post a link in the chat. And that's incredibly powerful in terms of compressing your data. And nonetheless, the, the compressed data can be queried, which is, I mean, extremely powerful at publications oh, like the one that you mentioned. That's I will post great. a link. Thank you. That's really interesting. I'd like to take, take a look at that. Yeah, I, I wanted to second that, Beth. That's the, exactly the question I've been wrestling. I mean, with drones, it's not not an order of magnitude that uh, satellites are doing, but exactly, we uh, are doing many things that are uh, we talking about in situ sampling, um, temperature, wind speed, the CO2 concentration, and then it's exactly that issue. Do we create an RDF for every single sample, every two seconds? Um, yeah, I'm also interested in looking at that audio of HDT. Uh, so, I'm finding all of this very interesting and, and a practical question. Can we get your guys' slides? That was really good. Um, but still feel a bit too lost in terms of thinking about how to apply this. Um, a question, just thinking about the IoT domain and um, from a simplistic, everybody's got a nest kind of, system, they're uh, sending out streams of data and they're not storing all of it. Um, do you know how how would I apply these things to a stream, to a continuous stream, not uh, I go out into the field and fly or my satellite orbits uh, at this rate, um, but my fridge is continuously sending out I am at 2.2 degrees. Um, you know, does, does anybody have any examples of how that's being used? So, um the old SSN, for instance, which was way more complex, was already used for stream reasoning. In fact, Dunn's PhD, if I remember correctly, was exactly about efficient stream reasoning over sense observations annotated using SSN. And SOSA is substantially more likely in terms of the axiomatization. And therefore, the reasoning over a SOSA is very cost effective. More details are in the specs. Um, so if you would like to use SOSA to 
annotate all the temperature measurements sent out by your fridge, then you can absolutely do this. But I would think you should ask yourself the question another way around. Why would you like to constantly send out the two degree of your fridge information every second? There are two ways to think about this. One is processing should be done inside the sensor or the platform that is housed in your fridge. And this platform can use in reason on SOSA because SOSA is so lightweight. So this is exactly one of those design goals and we have some application scenarios for that. Then if you decide this shouldn't be decided or reasoned upon on inside the fridge, but you would like to send it, you know, to create a record and observations are always about the past, right? To um, some system that then processes the data from the fridge or alerts you if the fridge gets too warm or orders new, I don't know, milk if you're out of milk. Then this would come at the more discrete time or at least if you would still like to, you know, to create them every few seconds and set them out, not all of them would be stored, right? So I think we need to take into account that our work is neutral to decisions of, you know, sampling time, storage, how long you would like to store data, how you would like to process data. Those are all very interesting questions, but they are more procedural questions where we purely address, you know, how to set up a model. And thanks again for asking these questions because this is exactly, you know, the mindset that we are sometimes missing just looking at the data, namely, you know, how does the procedural part work into this. Thanks again. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Lynn Pusha. I have a question. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Beth and everybody. Well, th uh, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. And um, I think it was really interesting, the question that Beth is asking. Uh, maybe we can talk offline a little bit about that. Just as an indication, my colleagues at uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, they have coupled, uh, um, they have a provenance framework store, which couples a, a triple store with a time series database. Um, what, you know, in order to store this type of um, big data, if you like, with a time series. But so um, my question is actually about the uh, calibration. And I would, I probably missed it in the presentation. Um, how do you encode the, you know, sensor calibration, for instance, in, in, the, in the schemas that you presented? So this is generally going to be something which uh, lies within the procedure. Uh, and, you know, I think a lot of those details um, are not yet, are not part of SSM, they would be extensions. And a lot of that, the material for that is in sensor ML right now. And in particularly in the um, connections between sensor ML and ISO 191115. Uh, so not not every one of those details, such as all of the possible units and phenomena and um, uh, procedures, are in the ontology as it's now. It's a really a, a framework um, to fill out as is needed uh, with some of that additional detail. But the um, the material with which to do that um, is largely already existing. It requires oh. some additional um, I think conversion and harmonization to do that. Okay, yeah. thanks. So that I think. And uh, do you? I mean, do you see any path for doing that, or is this? Is there any kind of work that's been already done um, somewhere? And I have done some ontology work that is really similar to this, but it's again at sort of the type level and not the token level, and it does include properties of measurements but it's it's measurements as they're related to the data that are being collected right so i want to know the spatial resolution the temporal resolution and and some issues like that and but i think what's nice about this ontological approach is that this kind of model you know add the things that you need right you can it's very extensible so you're not stuck with just the properties of the measurement that are there, but you can always extend that to accommodate additional things that you care about, right? Yes, so the, the ontologies are largely exchange formats, right? So we are not as 
just said trying to model everything which would you know take us an incredible amount of time and probably people would you know disagree because all domains handle data differently we are trying to give you something like the hooks right so we are trying to say if you would like to model this like calibration then please say that there's a thing a calibration and it's set up this and this and this way for you and it's part of the procedure and then immediately we can help you in reasoning or faceted search or publishing the data this is what makes the semantic web as you know a technology platform so incredibly powerful that we can align different pieces of information and put them in relation without having to model um, everything there is from just one perspective. Yeah, thank you. That's, uh, that's very interesting. Um, uh, hi there. Uh, this is Baska uh, Ramachandran, uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. Quick question I had was um, the SSN SOSA ontologies in the hierarchy of ontologies, when I say hierarchy, you know, foundation, domain, etc. cetera, is, is this considered more sort of the upper level or a foundation level ontology at the present time? There are, there are two ways to think about this, and Josh can probably also jump in here. Oh, I don't want to touch this. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, please go ahead. I didn't want to jump ahead. Just if you, if you would like to no, I want you to handle this. I'm okay. interested to hear. <laughs> so there are two ways of thinking about structuring ontologies. One is this top-level task application and domain ontologies. That's, so to speak, a little bit of the, the older school, and I don't mean this in any negative sense. All this alternative school largely coming out of industry and by Uschold and um, colleagues from Boeing originally, and that talks about global and local ontology. And the difference being made there is local ontologies are within your group, within your company, relation to your customers, within your industry or domain. And globals are the ones that are meant to facilitate interoperability. And personally, I believe this is the way better way to structure ontologies because what is top level and what not is difficult to answer. But what is a local conceptualization to serve your needs versus what do you need? use to exchange data between different platforms or customers or domains and it's a more intuitive way to structure and here very clearly source and ssn are global ontologies so that's exactly why some of the details you just requested are missing there on purpose this is the exchange level this is the glue that fits different observations together whether you are an internet of things sensor or whether you know you know you're interviewing people as a, I don't know, human geographer, and you are storing this as observations. This is mm -hmm. the glue that connects them. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Lewis, Lewis McGibney here, just very, very quickly before maybe we, we close up. <clears throat> um, I don't know, Josh, I met you previously at the ESIP uh, winter meeting, I believe, but um, Christoph, I don't know if you're going to be at the summer meeting. Um, what I did hear earlier on and what I've seen on the W3C um, spatial data on the web mailing list is that um, for SSN and SOSA, they're currently looking, as Chris Joff had mentioned, for um, essentially use cases. And I think that um, if, if there are any compelling ones that come out from today that people want to progress, then I think heading over to W3C spatial data on the web working group would be an excellent idea. I think having perspective from these um, you know, having having the perspective is always valuable, and hopefully we'll produce a better um, standard uh, in the next number of months. Another couple of things I was going to mention is that uh, Christoph or Josh, would you be kind enough to maybe post um, a link to where these um, the use cases are currently being gathered um, to the, either the chat box or else to me and I can just or, or, or to either one the drone or the semantic web list. I don't know where we're going to kind of consolidate all this stuff. What would probably may, maybe suggest is that we, we put it to the drone list for this point in time because it's the drone telecon. Um, and the final one was from me, uh, uh, Chris Joff, since it was you that had mentioned it, um, has there been any use cases or have there been any use cases which have come in so far which have been topically um, limited to the drone community yeah. and if not then it sounds as if that would be a call to arms for people on this call to maybe try and step up there. Uh, so a uh, couple things, uh, the the specification 
for Sosa Estesen is eminently readable, uh, mm-hmm. and I recommend it. Uh, it has mm-hmm. you know informative examples and so on. Uh, they are some use cases and requirements that were behind that to be found in the use cases and requirements document that the uh, W3C group also came up with, and that's published. You can find that from the uh, Special Data and the Web Working Group um, website. And the thing that's needed most urgently now are actual implementations, you know, data encoded applications that make use for whatever use case of the elements from the new vocabulary. Uh, but going forward, then, uh, and there will be this kind of continued coordination between OGC and W3C, particularly on uh, how to align and harmonize this vocabulary with other specifications and other domains. Uh, and specifically in the case of drones, uh, there's been uh, a lot of interest in two things. One is uh, describing uh, a plan for a uh, mission in a platform independent way. And the other is figuring out how to encode and describe um, a result, an image, for example, uh, in such a way that you know a processing system can accept input from a variety of platforms and missions and still make sense of them. Uh, that isn't connected directly to SOSA SNN right, SSN right now. It's, I think, often on the practical edge, like, you know, what can we, should we get into GeoTIFF, for example. Uh, but uh, it will eventually have a connection to the more general model. I was just going to say, Lindsay and Jane, is it possible to save this chat box? Because there's quite a lot of interesting links in this chat box. Yes, absolutely. So what I was going to say is that um, I believe Bruce um, actually recorded a, a decent amount of the session, and then hopefully we'll also get the, the slides as well, and I'll save the chat box and sort of package it all up as um, sort of one email to send out to the, both the drone and the semantic tech um, listeners so people can have access to that. Um, I want to take a quick second to thank both of our speakers again. Thank you, and thank you, Lewis, for, for helping to set this up. Um, and just a quick um, plug, I guess, to say that um, I, you know, there's a lot of overlap we heard here. I think there's a lot of really 